Hey boys and ghouls, are you ready to raise the dead? For the month of October, December sci-fi versus horror. Beep boop, intro music. Welcome to Cypher Cypher, I'm Explore Harold Y. I'm Christopher Peterson. I'm Lee Colbert. And we have special guest co-host from from Tokyo and from a year ago. It's Calum Rail. Yeah, here I am. I'm so happy you're here, Kay. Hey, I'm I'm happy to talk to you guys again one year later. Yeah, it's been a minute. Kay keeps kind of quiet online, but he is a very talented musician and artist and photographer and all the things. That's true. I am a competent musician and composer <laughs> and sound designer. It pays my rent. So competent enough. But the art that we have up right now for Halloween stuff is K. The music in the beginning of the show is K. I'm sure there's other stuff I can't remember is K. I put the idea for Horror Month, I think. The idea for Horror Month is K, perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm totally the uh, third member of the, uh, the team. Hey, we watched a movie. Oh, yeah, we sure did. Yeah, that's why we're all here. What was it? Paul Anderson's Event Horizon. Is this a classic? People yes. remember this like fondly as like a cheesy horror classic. Is that it? Yeah, it did not do well when it came out, but it kind of exploded on VHS. A VHS. Because it's way back in the day. Oof. Because what year are we talking? Oh, it's like uh, oh, here it 1997. Is. Yeah, it's right in front of us. Yeah, I think it's because there's there's like a there was a huge uh, vacuum of like people who had seen Alien and Aliens, and there wasn't a lot of stuff like that. So I think it just came in and it was competent and it was lit okay, and the the story wasn't horrific, and a lot of movies like this generally tend to be. Um, and and so I think it 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 kind of just slid into classic status classic film status that's how i remembered it i'm surprised i looked at like the tomato meter or whatever it's like 20 percent. really i remember it very fondly though yeah me too <laughs> from when i was a 13 year old watching a gory movie maybe that's it anyway yeah uh spoiler we're gonna spoil the movie what is event horizon about that's a good question event horizon is about uh cosmicism right on it's man. about man's place in the universe or lack thereof you know we're all just uh, blip and nothing, Morty. I love your conciseness. <laughs> I would have said haunted house in space. <laughs> also concise. <laughs> I appreciate your approach, Colbert. No, I, I, I also agree with that. It's absolutely a haunted house in space. That's a very good description. Space house. But I need, mm. I need <laughs> space house. I need people like you, Kay, to come here and be like, "Here's what something's actually about," because I miss the point of everything. Yeah, I, I, I generally skip like, um, what is this literally about, and go right to like, oh, what's it about? You know, I, I overthink movies. The I, line that I think might be from Ebert, that is at least how I remember hearing it. It was, it's not what it's about; it's about how it's about it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, or uh, I'm sure I said this last time I was on the show, or as Harry Cruz put it, there is when you write a story, there's what happens. And then there's what the story is about, and they're two different things. Mm -hmm. In any case, this is about uh, man's empty place in a haunted house in space. <laughs> yeah, so like uh, a ship went around Neptune to do an experimental thing, disappeared, and now we're on a rescue mission to see what happened to it, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was. Uh, it's, it's considered the uh, we we have a slow future waiting for us. Don't listen to Elon Musk. Oh, okay, okay. So even before the uh, it it reveals that um, <laughs> this 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 movie has a god awful opening. Anybody could um, even back in the '90s, I think people would have watched this and and thought, Jesus Christ, what are they trying to convey here? It was jarring, at least. It's incredibly jarring, but uh, big long title sequences at the beginning of movies. Uh, they weren't just there because people were uh, mega maliacal, you know, they weren't egotistical monsters just wanting all their names at the beginning of the movie. The beginning of the movie and the reason for all the credits at the beginning was always because it was a, a tone setter. I mean, uh, they would set tone with the music and uh, they would have sometimes they'd have animation. Whatever the imagery, uh, yeah. 
Exactly. It was uh, the, the that slow crawl was to make sure everybody was uh, inside the theater, people that were running late, and it was to set tone. And so, if you were arriving late to Event Horizon, you'd walk in and you'd, you'd be like, it, it felt it, the beginning of the movie feels like you're in a club. It sounds like '90s club music, and it has a swirling blue uh, 3D background, and it is absolutely not indicative of the the rest of the movie. Yeah, yeah. Don't and, get me wrong. It looks awesome. Like. 90s weird techno goth rave feels great to me. Maybe it's just a good old misdirection. Like you have no idea what this is about. You really have no idea because it certainly isn't a 90s goth techno rave. Mm, I think it's just like uh, having worked in graphics and um, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly certain they probably just shopped it out to somebody and said, just make something. And that's what they got back <laughs> because it, it really doesn't feel like it has any relation to the rest of the movie. So, so after the thing that has nothing to do with the movie, we learn a bunch about the movie in the text crawl. Thankfully. Thankfully. Yeah, uh, it, it's got that text crawl, and uh, this is totally off the top of my head, but it the the movie itself is set in 2047, but the uh, the event horizon disappeared, was it 10 years prior, or? We have, we are offered a timeline of a sort, our it, it actually gives us the history of space settlement that gets us to that point. So humans have settled the moon, a permanent colony, by 2015, and then have commercial mining permanent operations on Mars by 2032. See, what's really, really interesting uh, about that is that I was so disconnected by the nightclubbing music, I had zoned out by then and was no longer <laughs> paying attention. So I came in and it was just like, blah, 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 the event horizon was the worst uh, space disaster in history. And I'm like, okay, that's where we start. It ultimately doesn't matter to the story at all. Well, no, but it's, look at where you are. Yeah. This is Cypress Sci-Fi, and like someone yeah, know, mentioned a thing. <laughs> you're, you're, it's like the beginning. If you chopped it out, you'd be like, oh, okay. But it's that's, I'm glad it was there because it's actually kind of interesting to think about. Look at the future that it's designed. It took from 2015 to 2032 to go, well, actually, it's interesting that we just started on the moon period because when this movie was made, you know, 1997, I don't think we imagined maybe going to Mars first. We didn't, even, we didn't even imagine going to the moon anymore for that matter. And now look at where we are now. It's 2017 and we're talking about whether we should go to the moon or Mars first. Like we're actually gearing up to do one of these or actually both of these things. Is that is that really a serious question though? Yeah. I mean, to me, oh, yeah. it seems. It, it, oh, that's insane. I mean, why would you why would you avoid uh, a permanent um, zero gravity launch pad into space to go directly to Mars? Okay, so yeah, that there are there are advantages and disadvantages to either one, right? And the people who are arguing about a lot of these things, there are different reasons that you want to do it, and so the different reasons you're doing the thing might influence your choice. But you're right. The moon's advantage is that it would be like it's as a far as space closer. goes. It's really close. It's not close. But as far as space, yeah, it's a lot easier to do stuff on the moon. It's a lot easier to get there and use it. And also it having such a small mass, it's an easy landing situation where there's no like atmosphere to confound the approach. It's a great place to train people for what to expect in a zero gravity. I mean, there, there are more benefits and disadvantages. I mean... It, it just seems like a good idea. But the problem, there's a couple of problems. Like public interest and marketing are actually an issue. Yeah, you and kinda, if everyone's not pumped up about it. You need cultural will. Yeah. I mean, if, if everyone, think of 19, think of 2002. We weren't talking about settling space like as a real conversation. People weren't pumped up about any of these things and the moon wasn't interesting because it's moon, it's dust, whatever. Now, if it took a conversation about Mars to get every pump, everybody pumped up, then that's, I think that's great. I'll take it. I don't care. I don't care what planet we're getting pumped up about. I just want to be in space. No, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think that that's probably the great um, tragedy of the present is that we lack Ray Bradbury's to romanticize and mythologize space for people and and you know direct them towards it i mean it, it's it's a shame that when people look up they're just like mining opportunities we definitely need these guys where are they i don't know if we're missing the bradburys i think we're missing the bradburys being placed in a respected and a respected position with a bullhorn you know yeah. that's that's a good point that's a really good point i think fortunately we have people actually doing things now they have the a vision and they're attempting to see that through i'm into it man and that's the thing with Mars, too, when Elon Musk is in the Mars. And 
ultimately the moon makes a lot of sense as a place to put your stuff and launch or whatever. But for a permanent settlement, it would be nice if it could be self-sufficient. And on the moon, it probably can't be self-sufficient. So that's very costly. As opposed to Mars, where it is potentially a place where we could use the resources there to actually just exist on Mars. Hard to get to. Hard to land on. Yeah. Yeah. That's the drawback, isn't it? Hard to but, help you if you, anything happens. But the, the day-night cycle of the moon is like, in hosp- I don't know, incompatible with how we grow food on Earth. So like, that's a problem. And the energy required to to do it artificially would it doesn't make sense. But we don't. Yeah, we don't. Uh, that's that's exactly the point. Mm. I mean, you 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 address these problems with solutions. So you, I mean, by the time we get to the stage where we're we're having to farm in the dark on the moon, I would imagine we would have some kind of. Um, I mean, the idea would be creating a crop that would grow in this environment instead of like worrying about like only being able to farm for. Uh, X amount of time before we get darkness for X amount of time, we would we would solve the problem by creating something that, that can just grow in the dark. I mean, maybe we just live on mushrooms. Oh, oh, sidestepping um, solar powered chlorophyll based life for yeah, I don't know, and maybe. F- and moon mining has been a you know an idea. Yeah, we we well we'd we'd have our our Mars energy sources there. We just grow big sheets of fungus to live on, maybe. That's Sounds the goal. delicious. <laughs> it does. I like fungus. <laughs> oh. mm. <laughs> Enjoying your fungus paste for breakfast? And lunch and dinner. So- Sacrifices would have to be made if we're going to space, you know. I'd, I'd be happy to do it. I mean, if somebody told you, uh, you can go to space, you can go on this incredible adventure, but you're going to be eating food that tastes like dirt. Uh, you know, I think most people would make that sacrifice. Do you have hot sauce? Yeah, problem solved. <laughs> Just that's where they invented. Sauce. Yeah, that's the greatest invention of all time is hot sauce. Can you imagine it's going to be like cigarettes in prison? Just bottles yes. of Tabasco as currency in space. Yep, absolutely. There is, there is the future economy is not backed by gold. It is backed by hot sauce, chilies, and vinegar. <laughs> that's that's your hot tip. But what's great, th- what I love is that we just had this conversation that was a single throwaway line in the text scroll in the beginning. And the other thing is that that's actually, in the world of the film, they've moved beyond that still. Like this, it was yeah. just a footnote because they have explored further. They were so bored with the inner solar system that they have they don't mention doing anything in the asteroid belt, which would be obvious for like mining resources. They're, they're, they're at the edge of the solar system doing research so that like we're out there now. We've gone further. I'm pretty certain most uh, uh, sci-fi text in the beginning of movies they are, they're there for aesthetic reasons rather than um, certainly post Blade Runner I think people just put them there because they look cool and trust that nobody's really going to read them or read maybe uh, 10% like I did <laughs> I rely on these things for the show so I'm glad they're there sometimes they put a ton of detail not only to the text but in the, the scenes that are up for a second because I'll wind up pausing them to read them. Interesting. And somebody's just run with it and just filled in tons of information. I love when they do that because that's what we basically tell you. Here's a secret about Cypher Sci-Fi. It's like the first 15 minutes in the movie are 90% of the things I have to say. Because it's all those little build, world building bits. Like the guy picks up a weird gadget and puts it down. And I'm like, there we go. <laughs> or they mention Mars. And I'm like, let's talk about settling Mars for half an hour. Again. <laughs> again <laughs> but i rely on that stuff because yeah like that's the problem with when we've tried to talk about a book before all those little world world building touches that you would see in the environment while the story is happening are not communicated in the book because they're busy telling a story with words and like i have nothing to say about it i need all those things like you had noticed the the patch on weir's suit oh fly suit right yeah, absolutely. Well, that was the uh, that was the the thing I wrote down on my notes that uh, really stood out for me, and really didn't stand out for anybody but Kay because it's so tiny. <laughs> yeah, it's so tiny, but they all they all have their their countries of origin, and I think uh, the the captains from uh, a part of Africa, and Weir Sam Neill's character is he has the the Australian. Uh, it's definitely the Australian flag. Uh, it's the what they call the Southern Cross portion of the Australian flag, which is the stars, which show the Southern Cross. 
And in the corner of the flag, uh, currently, there's a Union Jack because it's a Commonwealth nation. It's, it's part of the United Kingdom, technically, or, you know, they were colonized, basically. Uh, but in the future, in the movie, it has the Aboriginal flag, the Australian Aboriginal flag. And I think that's really cool. It, it's basically that says to uh, people watching that there's been some kind of uh, schism towards a democracy uh, instead of a commonwealth. And it also says that we've, we've made some ground in as far as uh, making amends with, with Aboriginal peoples in the, the countries that have been colonized and settled. I, I found that really interesting. And that in combination is what we see of where people are. People are in space. We have colonies on the moon and Mars now. Like, maybe we got shit together. Yeah, maybe we, that we suggests something. Our, <laughs> which, which is kind of the, the, the utopianism of, of science fiction. I mean, it's, it's, it's the reason why so many people love it is because it, 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 it just, we, we get our shit together and then we move into space. You leave these we, geopolitical spats behind. Exactly. I mean, I mean, the problem with the present is it's all geopolitical spats, and we we hope for a better future. I mean, the best thing about sci-fi, it's like we, that's done. This is what we do next. And it goes great until you lose your research vessel behind Neptune. And when we, what we're told is it still in the crawl? Are we still in the crawl for the movie? We're 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 dipping into we're dipping into and out of the the first twenty minutes of the movie because I think uh, we also learn about that the the event horizon was a research vessel, experimental vessel that was lost. It was the greatest space disaster you started to mention before. Yeah, it was apparently uh, we 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 find space travel to be incredibly safe and incredibly non-eventful. The first eventful thing to happen is the disappearance of the event horizon. It said that loss was the worst on record. I just thought that yeah, was a weird a way to put it. off record. Well, because like how many space launches do we have in prehistory? What is the point of uh, why was the why was the event horizon sent out into space? Research. What were they researching? It's a secret. Why Why didn't they send uh, uh, drones? Why didn't they send robots? Why didn't they send, uh, you know, Apple laptops strapped to a camera? Because this is the late 90s. Yeah, sometimes I sh- wonder if we should just change the sh- name of the show to like, why didn't they send robots, the podcast? <laughs> because that's all, that's the main question we have to ask over and over. And the answer is always just because it, it, it doesn't, the, the world doesn't make sense somehow. Almost never is it touched upon. Uh, but and, this is another instance of you really should have sent robots out. Or is it just that trivial and safe and normal for humans to travel? Especially because the drive technology that we have is affordable and fast well i think one issue is the time lag for communication if you're going to send something out to neptune to test a thing hey guess what it's going to take you several days to communicate or it will require incredible ai development that a thing can do it without you at which point it's probably a lot cheaper to send some dudes yeah, it'd be way cheaper. That that makes perfect sense. That's brilliant. I mean, you can rely on a certain amount of agency from highly skilled people to deal with the problem. So they can not only deal with the the goal of the mission, but they can deal with the the moment to moment uh, problems that they may have to solve that are bound to happen. Yeah, exactly. Like think about how hard it was to control the rovers on Mars. Like there's a little bit of autonomy and a little bit of point and click over here, and they go. But that's very limited. And even that's Mars. Like they actually, they're behind Neptune in this movie is what we're dealing with. Mm. So like we're talking about a lot farther and a lot harder to actually have any real time input on. So I guess time to send some people. Oh, and don't forget, we that's a, we have a thing in this, in this world that enables humans to do that. It's that we have resource mining in space. So the part where it's hard to get people out there because it's so expensive to send oxygen and fuel and the whole thing and account for people to be there safely is we have we have space. We mind it. There's there's water out there. We don't have to spend all that energy getting it off of Earth's gravity well, out of Earth's gravity well, because it's on that asteroid and it's on Mars and it's on whatever else we've we've started stealing from. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, space is like unlimited almost in its resources. I mean, that's that's. 
kind of the attraction I imagine for people. Yeah, and a bunch of these resources are out past the the asteroid belt where they're not in a huge gravity well from a planet. It's you know smaller rocks, so it's actually accessible in a more affordable way. Which brings up another interesting point because once we reach a certain, uh, once we're able to send people out like they're doing in this movie, one would think that we're pretty close to being past scarcity. One would imagine there's some kind of universal wage just to keep people interested or something or something right yeah and so uh i mean i think that was that was the the biggest uh criticism of prometheus was that like you've got like this guy who's uh you know one of the world's richest men and he's sending out a ship to ensure his immortality and he crews it with the stupidest (laughs) he can find well compare that to this right we actually have Everybody's really competent. All these people that are here are really good at their job. That's true. It's not like it's lived in, you know, the inside of the ship, but it's not broken down. Did you notice the uh, the, the captain's chair, like the, the headrest? Duct tape. The, ha- yeah, half of it's held together with duct tape. So, you know, uh, this, this was kind of what crossed my mind is like, they must be pretty rich at this stage. So is he just like, uh, he keeps it like that for nostalgia or? It's just I mean, easy. I like- I have duct tape on a thing in my house. Like I could afford to make it better, <laughs> but it's duct tape. I like it. I like it better anyway. Lived in science fiction looks way cooler than than very sleek surfaces. It feels so better. I, I did appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, it feels more honest. Yeah, it's dirty in the ship because like, people don't actually in live it. in the Apple Store in real life. So that was actually. Don't forget, there's two ships in the movie. Right. So we have the the Lewis and Clark that they is a rescue ship that's going looking for the event horizon. And that's what we're talking about when we say it was a lived in ship, the duct tape on the chair, it reminiscent of like alien. Uh, but we also then we wind up on the event horizon and it has a much different design. Uh, yeah, well, for your listeners uh, that may not know this, and I doubt that's any of them, I'm but an event horizon is, and I'm sure uh, either you guys could explain this better than me, but the event horizon is, is part of a singularity. It's part of a black hole. And it's basically the, the point of no return uh, that once you cross that, you are forever in the black hole. Is that correct? Yep, that sounds about right. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the reason, that's a, good, that's a good name for the shit. Once, once you cross the event horizon, you're... you're also, can, can it's not because it literally, it, we'll talk yeah, about it later, but it, it literally uses, uses black, black hole. holes. <laughs> so that's actually pretty yeah. appropriate. Yeah, it's totally appropriate. <laughs> and then the, the Lewis and Clark, what? it looks like a spaceship, like you would think. Like this is, if I think of a spaceship, it kind of looks like this. And yeah, it's engines. not that roomy, you know, it's, it's like a submarine. It's the Navy analogy moved into space. Yeah, and I like the way that they discover the event horizon. It's somewhat in like the upper atmosphere of Neptune and it's dark, it's cloudy. They can't see from a distance. So they actually turn on spotlights and start uh, like examining it from the outside. And there's a raging storm. And then uh, from out of this, this lightning storm, uh, they, they see the event horizon and it's like a giant crucifix, right? Yeah. That should should have been the first clue. Yeah. It's, it's uh, yeah, well, that's right. (laughs) Beware. Uh, uh, but there it is. You're uh, the, what the movie is stating to the viewer is like you know it's it's gothic horror in space, folks. This is not. There's nothing good in the event horizon. Yeah, we got this creepy Latin message. The ship is shaped like crucifix. It's got spikes and buttresses. Yeah. So where the other one is like an actual like this is a navy analogy moving to space, like space tends to be in a film. This was much more ornate. I really really liked that scene. I thought I thought that scene was excellent uh, uh, because it's. The problem with most science fiction is that it looks so – they make space look like this this very clean environment. And if you've got like infinite space, you can imagine a scenario where, where almost anything is possible. And so that was really cool to see. I mean, I, of course, they were just trying to set up a gothic atmosphere, but I, I thought that was really cool. That was my favorite scene in the whole movie probably. It was cool. And not just the outside either. On the inside of the ship, there's like large, archy, open, spacey type – yeah, you, you, your first look at the ship is this giant like hallway that they have. Right. When they first walk in, huge, long. I'm sure this is something you're all familiar with, but uh, Joseph Campbell wrote a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, and he studied 
basically uh, almost every uh, folk culture on earth and found that there was a common uh, story that we keep telling and he called it the monomyth. It's the hero's the, journey. The, the hero's journey. It's, you know, it's the basic framework for everything from Lord of the Rings to the matrix to star Wars. Um, and uh, it, there, there are beats that are always hit. And, uh, the beat that, uh, event horizon kind of lives in is the belly of the whale. And, um, that's actually the way he titled the one portion. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. That's one of the beats of the mono myth is the belly of the whale. It's where the where the hero enters this thing that is the worst possible thing that they fear, and they've gone inside it, and they they realize uh, uh, in the mono myth they realize that uh, they have the strength not only to face this but to overcome this, but they also recognize that the safest place from the thing that you fear the most is inside it. I mean, if if the whale is the deadliest thing in the sea, and you're in the whale's belly, then you're you're pretty safe while you're in there. Um, that's exactly not true in the case of Event, event Horizon. <laughs> that's actually, uh, so much for that, huh? <laughs> Thanks, yeah, Joseph Campbell. so much for that. Yeah, they they never they never make it to you know. There's there's no realization of safety in there. Uh, what they do find though worse is worse. that I don't I don't know if you guys noticed this, but. Uh, um, the as they're approaching the drive, there's that whole hallway that looks like an, an undulating radula of like a, a teeth just kind of winding around. Um, do you know that word? No, it's no. Like, radula is like uh, it's like the the churning mouth parts of like uh, uh, lampreys and snails. Okay, they have like that makes it worse. Uh, <laughs> <That's exactly> disgusting. <laughs> Yeah, it's super disgusting. It's, Great word. It's basically, it's like a it's like a, a sheet of of uh, teeth with uh, with muscles behind it, I guess, and it just kind of undulates in order to like uh, digest stuff and chew stuff to push things I mean, along. Uh, the the those worthy path. in the movie calls it a meat grinder. And that's that, yeah, that's oh, what yeah, it looks like. Much. Absolutely. So so you've got like this this big radula hallway and you also like there are those um the doorways with the like the multi-lobed kind of sliding panels are also fanged like teeth yeah spiky so, and terrible looking yeah so like every second while they're walking into this thing it's it's absolutely they're they're crossing the threshold into into something very bad that's yeah. going to eat them who designed this interior and did it yeah, make it right. less spiky? Like they were like, can we cover some of these spikes? It looks, I feel like this might be a little dangerous. Uh, yeah. uh. Especially because ERG, like the, the, the ship can turn on gravity apparently, which is problematic. But like if you're going to spend you any trip? time in zero G, yeah. Or even if you just trip and there is gravity. But the those spikes everywhere, that's, that's really maybe in the chamber because technology is you know it focuses something or other but for the rest of the shit like turn off the meat grinder yeah. chill it's out just to look badass. <laughs> it does just look, to look badass, badass. that's interesting but you could still like maybe like put some glass between you and the meat gr- like the the radula part and yeah. uh paint it those put spikes, some clouds those, exactly exactly right but I, I, I think suffice it to say, like this, this spaceship was designed just to scare the people watching, and I really like that. Of I course. really, really like that. I, that's why there's spiky doors. That's why there's a hallway of, of um, you know, grinding teeth. It's just to make you feel bad. You mean because it was necessary for the gravity drive to work? The gravity drive. There is a gravity drive. That's actually like the main function of the ship was to have a, or to test a new special gravity warp drive sort of deal, and. That also might a little bit explain like why they have magical gravity on the ship for the people to exist. Like you, met, they have maglev boots, right? Yeah, but they also just have gravity. Like they hit a button and everything fell down because it is costly and time consuming to do things without it. Well, actually, here's the thing that I found out about the movie. Usually, there's not uh, much meta information, but this is just the thing I knew. Like they tried to do this as a movie where people float around. They were like, we're going to make it. It's going to be in space. And what happens in space? No gravity. That's what. And they started, and it was like guy wires and all the people floating. They were like, my balls hurt because of this thing. <laughs> and like, we, we give up. We give up. They just canceled it. They were like, fine. There's a gravity drive. Boop. It hit the button, and everybody could stand up. That's what happened, which is a little bit disappointing. But at least you see that they like gave it the good old college try and just couldn't afford to do it. It was too much. And the, the alternative being design the ship so that it has artificial gravity, you know, like actually physically could work, like a Taurus spinning sort of thing, mm-hmm. which this is totally not. 
but that doesn't work for your crucifix. And it wouldn't make it a scary crucifix. So Unless yeah, it was like a spinning ninja crucifix. You, you get a pat. <laughs> you get a pass for trying though. So what about the magical gravity drive? It's not magical. It's got gravity science words. No, it's still magical. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it sounded it sounded pretty magical to me. Like I know a little. Like uh, as I mentioned before, like I, I read Kip Thorne's Black Holes and Time Warps. That uh, makes me an expert in the local bar, but <laughs> an idiot in general regarding this stuff. Uh, and what the stuff he said sounded like just crazy talk to me. Well, he went through like the classic example of a wormhole. Well, but he tried to explain it in science words, and they got mad at him. Yeah, and punching through it, and like wait, wait, but make it simpler. It's like, okay, what about this? If I poke a hole in a piece of paper and yeah, hold the paper I, together, that's a wormhole through space, which is, we've seen it so many million times by now, but like, that's actually a really good analogy. Except, yeah, <laughs> except the way he describes it is, it's a black hole drive that makes a wormhole, but warp space kind of like, and a Here, I have a quote. drive. He said, the retaining magnetic field focuses a beam of gravitons, which folds space time until curvature becomes infinitely large and a singularity is produced. I don't, I don't know if that's possible to make heads or tails of that. Yeah, so it turns out it is not actually any of those things. It's just a portal to hell. Well, no, it is those things, oh. and hell happens to be another dimension nearby. You don't know if they actually went where they were going. It could have been like, nope, you go to hell, straight to hell, nowhere else. <laughs> All doors lead to hell? Yeah. Behind this door is a goat, <laughs> and behind this door is a hell? No, behind Would that. you like to change your yeah, answer? Behind the goat is hell, though. <laughs> There's still hell there. Yeah. To hell go. Yeah, but this this is an interesting conversation. Uh, oh, was it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, for, for people listening, you're like, they're already tuning out. They're like, okay, I've seen the movie where hell turns up. You could set that in suburbia. I've seen that one before. Blah, uh, blah, but, blah. Yeah, exactly, right? But what makes it interesting uh, from a science fiction perspective is, was this hell prior to people turning up? You know, was this uh, because this movie borrows a lot, a lot from uh, Solaris. Spoiler for Solaris. Yeah. In Solaris, it was reaching out to them and it accidentally did a bunch of traumatic things because it, it didn't know how to relate to human beings. And it, it just it, it, it probed their brains and it found these constant uh, like a toothache. It found that the most obvious thing that was happening that just happen to be traumatic experiences for the people in uh, the Solaris. Uh, in Event Horizon, it's borrowing this idea that this there's something uh, when they uh, between those two points when they they make a wormhole, there is something waiting for them there. And so the interesting thing about this is uh, was it held prior to them getting there is what I'm saying or is that because of their neuroses is that because of their um, because of all their baggage and shit? because there is a character in this movie whose sole role in the movie is just to know Latin so he can tell people that they're speaking Latin in the recordings <laughs> they get back from hell how convenient so actually to go back a second the reason they're going they thought it was lost it went behind Neptune and disappeared like that was the end they got a transmission on seven Earth. Seven years later. Seven years. Yep, it's a long time. Of a bunch of like horrible noise. Like if you heard this message and someone sent you this message, you do not go see them. You go as far away from them as possible. I was I was pretty surprised that when they played the recording, nobody like <laughs> even the comic even the comic relief character didn't go are, are you kidding <laughs> what <laughs> we're not gonna go there well no yeah. they're the ship that gets called like the people are like nope i ain't dealing with that you guys go but and nobody like, seems sufficiently right. horrified by this especially because the one guy's like wait wait i speak latin and tells them it says he his initial translation which was incorrect was what yeah his initial Save translation us? is uh yeah his initial translation is is save us and then he realizes that he's like he's missed some you know he, he hasn't conjugated the verb or whatever and it, what the message is actually saying is save save yourselves from hell yeah not just not only was the pronoun incorrect <laughs> liberate two tomatoes <laughs> liberate three tomato four yes. and then they yeah so i mean like even even the initial translation which was incorrect or whatever was was if there's a bunch of horrible, like, torture noises and someone says, save us, well, I guess I would say, call someone else to save them. I don't want to do that, but I guess they are the savers. They have to. That's the well, job. I mean, you have that one guy who 
constantly tries to rationalize everything. Like, no, that's not craziness. That's this thing going on. And it gets progressively, you know. Would that be me in this movie, though? Because I'm like, go start real and hell's not real. Everybody just shut up. Yeah. They're speaking Latin because they speak Latin. It's not because there's a demon. Hey, that dude is on fire <laughs> and he died 10 years ago and he's walking at me and it burns. <laughs> Well, this is this is the interesting thing. Uh, the other interesting thing about this scenario is if you've got infinite space and you have infinite time, potentially, uh, and you know, if you want to get into the multiverses theory, if you've got infinite universes, uh, eventually, if you cast yourself out there, you'll come across a scenario that's probably identical to what we consider hell. Um, so, from a scientific perspective, if if they're encountering hell. I mean, our rational brain would be like, oh, it doesn't exist. But it's like, how do we know this isn't just something that, that is, is for all intents and purposes identical? Well, that's the question, right? Are we talking about did they hit upon a place that is hell or did they hit upon or or let in, let's say, a consciousness or something that is taking advantage of them in a Solaris type manner, you know, because they have this mythology in their mind. I hadn't thought about that where, you know, trauma is very strongly held. For most people. So I guess that might stand out to an alien consciousness that has no, like, uh, points of relationship. Yeah, no context. So it's like, oh, you, got, you, you guys are constantly, you're, you're built around, like... Neuroses and, and her. Yeah, we all are. Absolutely. Uh, you know, that, that Freud wrote many books on this exact phenomena. I mean, and uh, if it tried to communicate with us, potentially it would try and communicate first via traumas and via uh, these things that we carry around so deeply. I think we should. I think we should clarify it for uh, potentially. If, if you know, if you have an audience of listeners that that don't even bother watching the movies, I'm sure it because um, yeah, I think so too. Like occasionally, I'll just listen to reviews of movies because people are like they're garbage, and I, I want to know what it's about without actually wasting my time. Uh, this isn't a garbage movie. However, for all the people that aren't going to watch it anyway, uh, what happens is, is they get to, they get to the event horizon, uh, and their, uh, mysterious events start to occur. It isn't just, uh, they, they arrive at the spaceship and the doors of hell open and, and Satan comes out and starts kicking. Shit. Uh, <laughs> like, like this stupid chair. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. Ex- <laughs> exactly. This couch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's there's none of that. It's far more subtle. So it starts uh, much like Solaris and much like Alien. It kind of starts picking them off independently. Um, and it, it, it reaches out in uh, like like hallucinations. What 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 you would think are hallucinations? What you would obviously think are hallucinations. Yeah, I think so, too. Like if I was in their situation, I would I would. I would worry about like uh, space psychosis or, uh, you know, I don't know, is uh, oxygen. Some uh, Do I have the bends? Yeah, yeah. Is there like a gas mixture issue that you're going, you know, you're, you're seeing stuff? Well, uh, as I stated before, I mean, if, if you have infinite space and we don't know exactly what is out there yet uh, as far as other consciousnesses, uh, I would be of two minds. I would certainly, my, my rational mind would treat this kind of event like I, I could very well be hallucinating or sick and I need to talk to the, the crew's doctor and I need to make sure that isn't the case. Um, but another part of my mind would, would want to treat it very seriously, like uh, in case it is something else, you know, in case it is a, a probing alien consciousness just trying to like say, can we watch Netflix and chill? I don't think it wanted Netflix and chill, though. Because, you know, if you send, like, a, a bunch of, like, um, military and scientific people into the void, I mean, some part of them might be romantic about what they're doing, but largely you're going to have pretty utilitarian people. Um, and so maybe it's just a case that they lack the imagination. So the this thing is 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 a uh, personification of their fears and anxieties and, and their imagination of what hell might be like. And they're just not very creative, you know, it comes through as like fire and brimstone. And in one later scene in the movie, actual uh, uh, demonic Goetian uh, sigils turn up on the ship and on Sam Neill's face. Yeah, I think that's probably one of the stronger arguments for why it's evil. Dude gouges his eyes out, <laughs> goes bald, has all this demonic like sigils on him, gets all super strong, 
What? How does how does it know that, right? You know, yeah, I'm with we, K here. If we if we take uh, the fact that it is actually hell off the table, you yes. know, like I'm comfortable with this. If we try and treat this scientifically, how does uh, the 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 consciousness know about like what we think are demonic writing? And you know, it would have to get that from us. The likelihood that this creature from beyond, whatever this eldritch, you know, ethereal cosmic power, knew Latin and that had a particular concentration on like Latin and symbology that is all like medieval Christian evilness. Mm. That would be suspicious. Maybe. Yeah. Or at least, <laughs> you know, it, it did certainly, uh, these, these symbols wouldn't be out of place on like a, a, a kind of 14 year olds, um, trapper yes. keeper. You know? <laughs> I probably would have had this on a t-shirt, you know? Yeah. <laughs> on exactly. a black light poster, no less. Psychic leakage. Yeah. leakage. But the the thing where maybe they lack imagination is very interesting to think about because this is this is, I guess and it's Samuel's thing. Like think of how many Lovecraft actually Lovecraft movies he's been in. This is a Lovecraftian horror thing. It's the not a lack of imagination, but an inability to conceive or understand of stimulus. Like isn't that how that works? Uh Correct. I mean, the the cool thing, what I really, really like about Lovecraft is there is always uh, a rational reason for the things that are happening. And in Lovecraft, the rationale just is potentially something so above and outside of our consciousness that that even attempting to comprehend it drives us crazy. So it, it it's perfectly sane and rational. You just have to be like an uh, you know four million year old multi dimensional amorphous <laughs> being <laughs> to be right? able to get it. Because this is something from outside. You know, it's it's, it's and we just don't get it. We it's we we so don't get it that it hurts. That it, <laughs> that it hurts. Yeah, exactly. Is that, right. This is really I, bad first contact. I feel I feel I feel like that's a very antiquated idea though like a 19th century barely turn into 20th century idea like and that's where lovecraft was writing right like the yep that mechanism like the 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 incomprehensibility i feel like that was a very lovecraft 19th century thing we don't seem to have that anymore except in the context of referencing lovecraft people still don't uh people still don't really understand what he's talking about i mean i've had it uh I think the fact that as far as pop culture is concerned, uh, we've reduced his work to kind of a plush toy <laughs> says, says that we, we're still quite disturbed by uh, what this guy was saying. Taking the teeth out of it? Yeah, we're trying to take the teeth out of it and we're trying to accept it because it is a, a, he, he says a lot of disturbing stuff. Aside from the, the, the stories about people going mad and monsters and otherwise, I mean, there is a real core of, of nihilism to his work, which um, uh, if you Wikipedia it or look it up on the Internet, uh, it's called Cosmicism. They, it, it's so specific to his work, it was given a term. Tell me about it. I understand the idea of nihilism, the meaninglessness behind everything that I kind of feel inclined towards. I think, I think uh, everybody... Uh, at, at, you know, at this point in history feels uh, somewhat of a sense of nihilism, even religious people, I think, uh, because of the glut of information from the internet, we all feel a little bit of like, um, not only cognitive dissonance with all the different facts we're trying to balance, but I, I think there's a there's a real sense of like, it's almost easier just to say there there's no explanation for all this than to try and work out how these things all fit together. Anyway, uh, cosmicism. cosmicism, cosmicism, cosmicism is, uh, specifically it's, it's suggesting that there is no evidence of any kind of benign, uh, gods in the universe or even malign gods in the universe. Uh, man is so insignificant in the cosmic sense that we just kind of exist like mold. And there are, uh, consciousnesses and beings that we would consider as gods, but they are so highly advanced compared to us, they're either uh, indifferent to us. We, they, we don't even register on their radar of consciousness. Um, uh, like, uh, How much do we consider the lives of fungus? Yeah, how exactly. often do you think of ants? Ants might be a stretch even. 
So uh, these things are, are so advanced and so old and so aware that we don't even show up on their scale. So all of our mythologies and all of our rationales and stories, it, 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 it so doesn't matter that these things don't even care enough to be maligned towards us. And uh, his stories are all rather horrific, but it's not so much that these things are, uh, you know, have designs to hurt us. We have just stumbled into somehow connecting with them. And they're like rolling over in their sleep and they're taking us out while they do that. That, That's the kind of interaction uh, in a Lovecraft story that kind of sums up cosmicism. It's a cosmic indifference. And that's the kind of thing we actually probably, after we discussed that, I feel like we're actually seeing in the movie, that if that creature is interacting even on purpose with us, that consciousness, it's just, whoops, you know, like stepping on something by accident, you know, just because how, imagine the perspective, you can't, imagine the perspective of something that ancient and large and and complicated. Yeah, deep time, uh, geological deep time, this is like a, a really cool concept, this is like... I read about this. Um, there, there, there are a couple of writers. Lovecraft's one of them, and a Japanese writer called uh, uh, Kenji Miyazawa. Deep time is uh, the concept of geologic time. So we we measure everything in terms of the human race and uh, our memories and our histories. And uh, when you compare that to the life of of uh, or even the concept of a diamond, like we're talking thousands and thousands and thousands of years human time is no longer relevant it's measured in deep time you know uh homo homo sapiens and human life is a blip on the radar of of geologic deep time that's 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 millions of years the visual analogy that i really appreciate did you everybody see the new cosmos no oh it was pretty great actually it was great it was great uh the new cosmos we i watched it with the kid the thing they kept returning to to stress I don't think he was trying to stress our insignificance and the nihilism thing, but that's what it, the effect. It was the visual analogy of he would walk on this giant calendar of the history of the universe, and it would be like, you know, uh, January, February, March, April, and we are humans. You have to are zoom in, in here. In the, keep zooming. Yeah. Zoom some more. It's, I keep zooming. Yeah. It's the last sliver of the last minutes of the last day of the year, and that's yeah. the entirety of all the intelligent life that we're aware of in the universe existing. And this, this is the, the really uh, fun part uh, of how this intersects with Lovecraft and science fiction is considering uh, Lovecraft borrowed um, a lot of concepts from writers that he admired. Uh, one of them was Algernon Blackwood. Uh, Algernon Blackwood was an English writer of ghost stories. And so in Lovecraft's most famous story, um, The Call of, uh, I think it's pronounced Clulu. Oh, really? Cthulhu was how I have it in my brain. Yeah, Cthulhu is how everybody pronounces it, or uh, Cthulhu. But I think in his letters, it's it's pronounced Clulu. Um, that's neither here nor there. Sure, why not? He starts, yeah, he starts his most famous story, The Call of Cthulhu, uh, with a quote from Algernon Blackwood. Oh. And that, that quote is, Of such great powers or beings, there may be conceivably a survival a survival of a hugely remote period when consciousness was manifested, perhaps, in shapes and forms long since withdrawn before the tide of advancing humanity. Forms of which poetry and legend alone have caught a flying memory and called them gods, monsters, mis- mythical beings of all sorts and kinds. And that's kind of the idea of deep time. It's, 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 it's a consciousness spread out over a million years. Not over 80 years, not over 100 years, not over 300 years. Something that, that uh, uh, thinks very, very slowly and expresses itself very, very slowly. Where we, we don't even show up in its radar of consciousness. I'm into this idea, like hardcore, because my concept of consciousness is just information processing, quite honestly. So like, why not have that be at a different scale and a different manner? Is just matter processing information. Absolutely. I mean, for all we know, trees think very deep thoughts. You know, whales potentially think very deep thoughts. I would say that the whale is an analogy we can understand because, like, we have a similar mammalian biology and neurology to a degree. But the tree, it might just be that 
we will eventually, I expect eventually, our concept of what thought is will be so expanded that we'll have to have new words for sure. the or difference. Or the time frame for which you consider a thought. To yeah, because over. if it is information processing, that tree is doing it too. Absolutely. It will be difficult to draw the line between the different forms of life and their manner of processing when we have a more thorough idea of how this whole thing works. Or if it's a, a physically separate, like a physically discrete body. It's like spread over a large distance. So yeah. communication necessarily well, takes a large amount of time. We could be thought of, and I think we'll come to this, like to think of humanity as an organism, you know, a collective. Yeah. Potentially consider uh, something that not only thinks very, very slowly, but has zero predators, you know, something that, that is just very long lived, like a fungus or something. Or a sentient uh, glass cloud. Or a sentient gas cloud, <laughs> or, in the, or, in the, or in the case of Solaris, a sentient uh, a biome of a, an entire planet. Or in the case here, uh, whatever is b- behind the wormhole, whatever is between um, those two points in space-time. We're basically a yep. tree. Pretty much. And from the point of view of that other consciousness, like maybe we're barely distinguishable from the tree, for that matter. And this is the failing. This is the failing of most science fiction, in my opinion, is that uh, we always uh, we always imagine that these things are going to be somewhat like us, and it's it's really fun. Like I love Star Wars. I really love Star Wars. But the idea that like the universe is somewhat like a shopping mall of just like you know people shaped people you know aliens <laughs> it, people shape people <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's so creepy <laughs> yeah that is kind of creepy no but but you know like uh it, it, they're all basically up to the same place in their histories and um uh in star wars they're all the aliens are somewhat up to the same place in their histories and uh in, in their maturity their emotional maturity and their their intellectual maturity it's pretty unlikely it's, yeah, it's yeah, it's I mean, as I said before, in an infinite universe uh, with infinite time and multiple universes, potentially there is a universe where everybody kind of evolved together and we're all it's like somewhat like a frat house. Uh, but it's unlikely that we'll we'll ever get to um, interact with that universe. It's far more likely that our first contact with an alien consciousness is going to be really weird. It's going to be super weird. <laughs> As this relates to cosmicism and, and Lovecraft, I mean, potentially uh, in in the scale of, of uh, geological deep time and the infinite, you know, uh, space of the universe, uh, we could be surrounded by signals from really advanced consciousnesses that we just can't interact with because we don't recognize them as um, communications. Mm-hmm. And so bringing that all back to Event Horizon, uh, all of these um, spooky and, and, you know, to be honest, somewhat lame uh, uh, <laughs> manifestations of hell and uh, our, our emotional hangups and our religious hangups, they could, I mean, they could all just be us. I mean, I, I think the movie would have been stronger if it ended on, on uh, kind of a point like this, saying that like all, all of this darkness and weird shit, that was us. You know, this thing is basically neutral and, and we brought... It's just a mirror. Yeah, it's a mirror of, of humanity. Our experience with this other consciousness was wholly negative, but that was because of us. You know, we might have flown into space and we might be uh, putting on our best faces and we might be pretending we like each other but if, if we don't actually address these things you know socially and um on a very deep level you know we we might carry them into the future to a point where it it kills us you know they're they're all there uh somewhat under the surface and uh they come to boil in a situation like this and wipe us out and that's the end of the movie what did we learn Shit, i learned that that was great be the best you can or some Inscrutable alien presence will annihilate you. What else is there? I don't know. We, we touched some really good points, but I would like to mention that uh, uh, seeing as we are talking about Lovecraft and it is such a sensitive issue, um, is- I don't know if you got how much you guys are aware of him as a as a uh, as insofar as his opinion. Oh, as he was person. racist or whatever. 
Some of the stores yeah. were like, whoa, you're from 1890. Holy crap. Yeah, I think he was proud of it. <laughs> hmm. You know what? Well, right now, like end of the show, we're talking about the movie is over. That was awesome. Um, and so recommend a related stuff. Let's recommend like a Lovecraft collection or whatever. I'll put a link to whatever sort of thing I find. But that guy was pretty great. And it's all free on the internet now for the most, right? Yeah, no, he was publishing outside of copyright length. Yeah, I think, Who I can think ever the, tell? The, the only thing you're paying for in regards to Lovecraft would be uh, brand new properties that people are making from his stuff. But all his stuff is just yeah. public domain. So cool. I'm going to totally link to whatever I find, whether it's Gutenberg or LibriVox or otherwise, because you can read all these things free and they're really good, like really good classic creepy stuff. Yeah, he's, he's some of really it's pretty racist, but I guess that you know definitely skip those. Skip the racist ones. Also, you know another thing to recommend. Okay, you are as much as I complain, you are not all over the internet. I wish you would no. be. You have an Instagram though, so I should direct people there. Yeah, you can direct them towards my Instagram. <laughs> my Instagram is uh, at enclosed spaces and. Uh, if you're looking for a very, very excellent uh, composer or sound designer or ghostwriter or photographer, you know where to come. Because, you know, what? It's, it's only fair that you do that because you are you seem to actually be excellent at all these things. And I wish that's what I talk what I'm saying. I don't complain about it is you. I wish you'd be out there more and doing more stuff. And it is hard work and it's not your nature to market yourself, which is unfortunate it's because it's such you. good shit. So we're very lucky to have connected with you on the Internet. Yeah. I imagine so. <laughs> <laughs> totally, though. It's just it's just one of those those rare conjunctions of good fortune for everybody. Because I, I really uh, uh, I really enjoy talking to you guys. Beep boop. We uh, forgot to do a thing, so now we're here on a different microphone, coming at you live from our satellite studio. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We had to do this though because it's important. I had the most important message of all: support your creators on the internet. Colbert. You've already told me like a hundred or something times. <laughs> I think I've gotten the message by now. <laughs> Clearly you're not listening. Because I don't see you on this list of people. Of what? Supporting the show. Oh, I don't support the show? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to read them off because they're incredible and they deserve mention. Joe Ferraro, Dean at LSG Media, Nicholas Little Boy Lowe, Daniel Yatmonder, Robert Robert Bob Robert, Jeremy, Andy P. at Batch 25 Comics, Brian the Sexy's Brother Peterson, Peter Van Loon, the Dutchman, Andrew Capitulo, the Mighty, Fireman Jeff Schwarmer, Chris Gennard, Mr. Ray Gun Curly Phil, Michael the Giantess Peterson, Sammy Mumby, Igor Smonsky, Elad Averon, Kobe FF Joe Rubble, Alaric Durk and Gunarm Superhero, John. To wear out your eyes. You don't need them where we're going, viewers. <laughs> <laughs> That'll work. And Dane James Barker, returning principal of the podcast, Adrian Falcone of this podcast sometimes, yeah. DJ Liberate, Two Tomato Moffat, and my mom and Grandma Judy, and Magical Unicorn Julian Creighton. A monster of vaguely anthropoid outline, but with an octopus-like head whose face was a mass of feelers. A scaly, rubbery-looking body, prodigious claws on hind and forefeet, and long, narrow wings behind. Our Eldritch Packer. Thanks, dudes. Eldritch Packer. <laughs> yes. Those people are great, because they went to the CypherSabot.com to support the show. Uh, if we're the thing you'd like to support, you could do the same. The CypherSabot.com to support the show. I can even say it a third time. The CypherSabot.com to support the show. You can also help us by telling others to cipher sci-fi.com slash subscribe. So now we're at the end of Kay's episode with Kay again. And if people enjoy it, uh, you know, they can uh, ask for me to come back and maybe I'll listen. Do it. You're one of my favorite uh, well, people. Just period. Yeah, it's always great fun have, talking. Oh, it's, it's, it's just cool to connect with you guys. I like people that think about anything, you know, and... and <laughs> have refreshing. And, <laughs> yeah, it's 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 no one's fault. I'm not one of these people that walks around calling people idiots because life is busy, man. There's a lot of details, so they're they're you know if if you're thinking about stuff on top of all the just the details of like like tying your shoes and making sure there's food in your belly and your rent's paid, uh, you know it it does take hard work, and I appreciate the hard work you guys do. It's a luxury to have the ability to do the work. That's convenience. Thank you, Kay. No worries. At Enclosed Spaces on Instagram is a good place for music and art stuff. And really yeah. cool pictures of Tokyo, which is basically Blade Runner. Yeah, I'm, I'm, like, I'm the least qualified person to come on this show and talk about anything, but I, I sure did enjoy it. And uh, it's, it's been swell.
that's the end. The end. Yeah. Hell is hell is only a word. Reality is much worse. Oh, good line. Right on, man. You win. I was also thinking where you're going, you don't need eyes. This is a podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good move. <laughs> I don't know if you want to include this, but I rarely listen to the show. Me too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it seems strange when it's people you know past a certain point to like. Yeah, totally. Uh, don't you think?